All right, good morning, and here we are again for yet another lovely day of CENG 3306 Mechanics and Materials. Uh, so, today, so today I'm going to cover lessons 38 and 39, and um, let's see, I do have a lesson 40 that I will record either today or tomorrow, but today is going to be the last day um, that, I, that I do meet for a recording session here at the Houston campus. But anyway, that's okay. I'm hoping to just, I want to finish out this series with all 40 lectures, but uh, let's get started. So the last topic that we need to cover is uh, columns, and specifically column buckling. So let's do that. I have quite a bit to get through, so let's just power on through. All right, so for lesson 38, our lesson objectives are uh, first, explain the derivation of the Euler uh, or Euler bu column buckling equation. That's just, I've heard uh, Euler or Euler, just depending on how um, proper you wish to be. Two, use the Euler equation to analyze and design columns. And three, classify columns as long or short based on their modes of failure. Okay, so first of all, um, let us actually define what a column is. So what is a column? You've all heard the word column before. When I say column, you probably have a vision in your head of something you've seen in a building, or if you're feeling more classical, maybe you have a vision of some Roman marble column in your head or something like that. Or maybe that's just what I have on my head, and maybe I'm just weird. Well, we already know that, but that's okay. Okay, so a column. Now, in most casual parlance, a column is simply a vertical member. Anything that's just standing up straight, carrying a load, is considered a column. But in terms of engineering, a column has a much more specific definition. And here, a column is anything that carries compressive load, but specifically a long, slender member that carries a compressive load. So I am going to draw two different columns here. Consider two different columns here, carrying axial load. A P, a P, a P, and a P. So a column is a long, slender element, a long, slender member, subject to a compressive, and that is also critical, to a compressive to a compressive axial load. So just because something is long and slender does not mean it's a column, it needs to be uh, in compressive loading as well. And what do we mean by slender? What does that mean? Well, this simply means that the, um, the length is much greater than the width. And the real reason for the, why this is important, if we have, say, a Imagine you have a non-slender um, column. Say you just have like a, a stout thing like this. Imagine just a cubic meter of concrete, or a cubic, say a, just a block, a cubic, feet, a cubic foot of concrete. Well, um, you have, may have seen before, you may later learn, that when you apply a point load to an object, it, the point load, the point force doesn't instantly, uh, does not instantly uh, carry or doesn't instantly translate across the entire cross section. What actually happens is there's a high stress here, but then the force, slow, the stress slowly um, transfers across the area. So in other words, this corner here is under almost no stress at all. This middle part, middle part is in a uh, a very high stress, and here, but that, but then um, past a certain critical distance, you'll end up with the full um, P over A developed in a member. But this only works for long slender members. So if we have a long slender member, we can treat that, we can ignore this and simply say, oh, the entire thing is under P over A. But if we have a short member, this is no longer valid. So our, um, our long slender member really allows us to use these point load assumptions. But anyway, so let us look at failure modes. And columns are going to have two main failure modes at least two main failure modes that we're going to consider in this class. If you wish to learn about more failure modes of uh, steel and concrete columns, feel free to enroll in my CNG 4412 concrete and steel design class. 
for those of you who are taking uh, civil engineering at the Houston Engineering Center, you may not have a choice. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. So failure modes, crushes, and buckles. And so column can crush or buckle. So it can cr we have crushing and buckling. And we can consider these as two different fail. We can consider these as uh, another case of, this would be a case of yielding. And this would be a, a case of lateral deflection. Uh, this is one case. This is one of the cases I really wish this was an in-person class because I could show you. A, I could bring in a big foam block or a big foam. Uh, I have this foam beam that I like to bring into class, and it's you can very easily see how columns buckle. In other words, if I have a column like this, a long column, long cylinder column, and I apply a load to it, it doesn't actually go all the way up to the point of crushing. What tends to happen is the column will buckle, so it will come. It'll go, say, like out like this. Or actually, it depends on how it's braced. If it was not braced in the middle, it would actually go, it'll bow out like this. It, that is called buckling. Where the material doesn't actually fail, we don't have overall, we don't just have, we don't have yielding. There's no point in the material that is past the yield stress. But the column simply loses geometric stability and pops out. And in terms of um, columns, that is in terms of structural and columns and machinery and things like that, we consider that a failure. And the reason for this is because this thing will just keep on going in the sense that, and the reason for this is that the moment this thing bends out like this, the, this load is no longer centric. And now it's going to be, it's a, this load will not only generate a compressive load in the column, it will also generate a bending moment in the column. So you end up with bending and axial load, which means your stresses are even higher, which means it's gonna bend even more, which means you have even more bending. That's known as the P delta effect and that can cause all sorts of issues. Okay, but we're getting a little off topic, but I never do that in this class, so. Me, off topic, never. So let us look at some examples. Or well, let's look at an example of how to design a column. I'll call this example one. So we have given and determine. A36 steel with a yield stress equal to 36 ksi. A, so this is a circular column with a diameter of 2.25 inches and a factor of safety, for some strange reason, of 1.0. I guess we're still keeping things simple. Maybe we've, over, maybe we've been really uh, conservative in estimating our loading, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, anyway, but we want to determine if member can su support 60 tons. We want to determine if member can support 60 tons or 120 kits. So load 60 tons, and what do you get another day? Oh, never mind, that's not right. Okay. So solution. Let's get this. Solution. First, um, we're going to come back to the mother equation, or mother inequality, for this whole course. Actual is less than or equal to allowable. Actual is less than or equal to allowable, our very familiar equation. Like, man, as the semester goes on, the professor gets screwier and screwier. Okay. So let us keep working through this. P over A is equal to your sigma actual, this is all just based on normal stress, is less than or equal to sigma yield over factor of safety. So this is assuming a yielding case. 120 kips. Oh, let me get more up here, try to squeeze this in. 120, oh, oh dear, what just happened there? 120 kips um, over, well, the area is fairly simple, it's just pi d squared over 4, pi over 4 
times 2.25 inches squared is less than or equal to 36 KSI over 1.0 or 30.18 KSI is less than 36 KSI. So in other words, we're okay. The stress in the member, assuming a factor of safety of 1.0, is um, going to be under the yield stress. So this is okay, will not yield or crush. But let's look at buckling. Will not crush slash yield slash yield at all. Now, so in terms of yielding, this column is fine. But um, what if we look at buckling? So we need to actually learn something about buckling. So I'm going to describe buckling theory, and then I'm going to come back at this example and see if it's okay or not. So let's see. Let us redefine a column. Is let's look at this. So columns are kind of dangerous in that they can buckle. And the real deadly thing about this is that a structure, they are a structure, is stable and in equilibrium. And in equilibrium. Uh, with no apparent deformation. So everything is fine. You have a structure, you have a column that's happily loaded, you can look at it, it looks perfectly fine. Um, then, then what happens? We apply a little more load and sudden catastrophic failure. I'm using dark red for this one. Sudden catastrophic failure. Buckling is a very dangerous failure mode. You want to really apply a decent factor of safety so you can avoid this. This is why buckling is so dangerous, because it's a sudden catastrophic failure. When something is failing in yielding, if you, ha if you make the yield stress your um, design stress, the allowable stress, well, we have learned in this class that there is actually quite a bit of, quite a bit of capacity beyond the yield stress. There is, you could, um, even if you, you may be doing damage to your structure if you take it up to the ultimate stress, but you know what, it'll still be fine. It, it, it will not be, it will not necessarily perform as well as you would like from then on, but it will still, it's not going to collapse. If you set your yield stress as your design stress, you, you have a lot of extra capacity, you have a lot of uh, a lot of margin, but buckling, it's, in, or in other words, uh, if something is yielding, you're probably going to be able to notice it. If you're in a building and a beam is buckling, you're going to see stuff like your floor cracking, you're going to see stuff like drywall cracking, and, you know, stuff that is re really obvious. You're going to have a lot of warning before a column yields, or before a, before, before a um, or you're going to have a lot of warning while a beam is yielding, or while a column is yielding. It takes a while, so you have potentially even years before it finally um, comes down. If, if it will come down at all, it can be it could be comfortably within the um, partially plastic zone, and it'll never have a problem at all. But buckling, you have no warning. It simply loads up to a critical value and then catastrophically juts outward and fails, and the whole thing comes down. This is what's dangerous about um, columns. So let us discuss Euler buckling. So you really want to do everything you can to avoid Euler buckling. Simply because it's such a dangerous mode of failure. Okay. So let us say we have a column, and this is a very unusually drawn column. I've never seen any columns but like this in the real world, but um, it's just our model like many things, just, just an engineering model. So we're going to have a pin or a roller column. 
So this is just a way to have a column that's in pure um, in pure axial load. So say I have a roller or a column that is on a roller, and it's like this. So this thing is free to move up and down, but it's not free to move left and right. And we have a pin down here. Okay, so this is a pin, and basically what we have is a pin and a pin, really. A pin and a pin, so consider it like this. Um, so this thing, in other words, is going to bend something like this. When you apply a very large axial load, it, I shouldn't say bend, it will buckle like this. And this is the um, length here, L. And let's see here, this is under load P. And the only reason I've drawn these really particular, peculiar pins is because if I draw it with like, with like a pin like this, well then you might say, wait, if it's, if it's glued down there at the ceiling, how is it gonna, um, how is it going to move downward under a, an axial deformation? So this is just a very particular, peculiar way of drawing it, simply allowing it to move uh, as a pin. Now, um, so the formula for Euler buckling, uh, and this was derived by Euler, what is pi squared times EI over L squared, over L squared. Alright, so let us consider this. What are, so let me define all these things. You should be able to figure out most of them already. Pre-critical is the critical buckling length, or critical buckling load. Critical buckling load. The critical buckling load. Max load before buckling before column buckles, or starts to buckle, to buckle, uh, E, well you know this one, what is E? Yes, your modulus elasticity. Now this does get a little bit, um, in this does get really interesting when you start dealing with reinforced co uh, concrete columns, because then you have a combination of both steel and concrete, and things get very interesting very quickly. But that's why we have an entire course in steel and concrete design. So I is the moment of inertia. Um, and now here's the critical thing. Columns are not picky. They will buckle in any direction that you give them a chance to. So if you have a column, you need to find moment of inertia both IX and IY on the cross section. So if your IY is um, much less than your IX, it's just going to buckle out in the, weak in the weak direction. See, with beams, you get, you, you get to play nice. You know, if you have a beam like this, say you have a beam like this, like a I'll make something that's obviously non-symmetric in the, or obviously has more, more bending capacity in the X than the Y. See, this shape here is going to have way more bending capacity about the X axis than it would about the Y axis. So, as long as I know, this would make a great, say, a floor beam or a roof beam or something like that, as long as I know that I'm not going to have to um, carry much lateral load. This is going to be very strong and very efficient if I apply vertical loads to it, but it's not going to do very well with lateral loads. But if I try to use this for a column, uh, suddenly I have a problem. Because, yes, it's, if, if the column tries to buckle this way or this way, this, this, this um, member, this cross section is going to say, no way, buddy, you ain't going that way. But if it tries to buckle this way or this way, 
he might the the uh, column might say the cross section might say hey you can't go there but the uh, column is just going to keep on going anyway so it doesn't have so again buckling um, buckling does not uh, is not preferential to direction it will choose the easiest path available to it so um, that is actually why on sections uh, for columns in steel design what you tend to see is you tend to see like Whereas beams, you see, tend to see very t sort of slender, tall sections. With um, columns, you tend to see sort of stout sections. Something more like this. Something that's going to have quite a bit of resistance in both the x and the y direction. So you see very uh, compact sections is the term for it, uh, for columns. So um, when we looked at the steel table, we said that different shapes are um, specialized for different or optimized for different applications. And that's really what we're talking about. And uh, L is the unbraced column length. And we will, I believe we'll talk more about that in a bit, if not, let me take, let me take a look at something. No, actually, I probably, probably should talk about that. Unbraced column length. Unbraced column length. So what do I mean by unbraced column length? It's not the actual entire length of the member or the column. Unbraced column length. What do I mean by this? Columns will buckle uh, depending on how you support them. So in other words, if I have, um, imagine I have a series of columns under the same axial load or just under axial load but I brace them at different locations. By bracing, what I mean is I um, simply do not allow them to buckle. So I'm going to apply axial loads to each of these. And let us look at, uh, and I'm going to brace them. So say, it, say I put a pin here and a pin here. In other words, I fix this thing horizontally at the middle. What if I do the same thing here? I put a, but except this time maybe I'll put two pins, just two sets of pins. So I, for, I forbid this from deforming laterally at this location and this location. Or I could, uh, I could try to draw three, but I think you'll kind of get the point. So let me show you how these would actually buckle, but what shapes they would make. Well, this is gonna go like this. Its geometry is, is not constrained in the middle, so it can just bow out in one arc. This one here is going to have to bow in an S-curve. This one is going to have to go something like that. It's going to bow, bow in a really a triple curve. And the real power of this is that we are in, by doing this, it takes a lot more force to bend a column, or a lot more force, a lot more energy, to bend a column like this than it does like this or like this. So this column here, because it's braced, can withstand a much greater axial load. Now, this has a limit. You can't get infinite strength out of the column. Really, um, if you have a certain, past a certain critical length, you actually don't have to worry about buckling at all. You can actually say, it, you can, you'll actually take your column all the way up to the yield stress. Basically, the limit of this, in terms of how many braced, uh, po bracing the points you add, is simply when it reaches the um, when it reaches the yield uh, stress or the yield, when, when it reaches the yield in failure mode. And this is actually critical in buildings, um, especially in tall buildings. If you, uh, I don't know if you've, if you look at the, say like the World Trade Center from the point of view of a engineering, um, obviously there's a lot of ways you can look at that day. That was a very um, momentous day in American history and all that kind of stuff. But looking at it purely from an engineering point of view, what happened that day, from a purely, I'm only looking at it from an engineering point of view. You have on the outs, the building was uh, designed with an interior core, but on the outside were these long, very long, slender columns that were a thousand feet long, then all the way up out the outside. That went all the way up out the, uh, oh, sorry. that went all the way up on the outside. There, I can talk now. And these were, so you had trusses carrying each floor. Trusses carrying each floor. And then there was the core in the middle, the strong concrete core in the middle. 
that's where all your stairwells, elevators, etc., etc., are. And so you, you have these very long, well, <laughs> relatively slender. I mean, they're compared to their length. There, I mean, if you look at them, they're massive columns, two feet, you know, kind of two feet thick, two feet wide steel beams or something like that. But compared to their length, I mean, if you have a two foot wide or a foot wide member or something like that and make it a thousand feet long, well, compared to its length, it's a string of spaghetti. It's spaghetti, yeah. But the way this worked was the floor trusses um, braced the column. The floor trusses served as column braces. But during the fire that day, what happened was, a, well, first you have, you did have a lot of, you know, the way they designed these is they put a lot of um, fire insulation on the trusses to keep them from burning during normal office fires. But during the time on, of the plane impact, all that insulation was blown off. So now the, the very slender members of the truss were um, vulnerable to fire and with burning jet fuel and buildings and, or sorry, and then office materials and all that kind of stuff, some of these trusses failed. And when these trusses fail, if, if at the same location a, a, tr a couple of trusses fail, well, suddenly the unbraced length of this column has now dramatically increased and it is now past the buckling load and when this thing fails, if enough, but now, if, now looking at the side, if just, there were a whole bunch of these columns, if just one of them fails, it can pass the load off to its uh, its neighbors. But if two or three of them ha fail next to each other, oh man, this whole thing's coming down. Not probably not just two or three. A whole, if a whole bunch of them fail, this whole thing's coming down. And once um, once one floor fails, I mean, when you get that much mass moving, the whole thing is coming all the way down to the ground. But we could talk about that from all sorts of points of view. But that's ultimately what happened on that day. So a bit of History. Yes, if I if I ever hear somebody say jet fuel can't melt, melt steel beams, I'm going to come up and whack them with a giant uh, bolt wrench, a giant iron workers wrench. Uh, on the ultimate, the real ultimate. Oh, if you ever need to counter an idiot saying that, what you can say is um, that is technically correct. Jet fuel cannot melt steel beams. However, um, the yield stress of we have not talked about the effects of temperature on yield stress, but it's actually this kind of relationship. Oh, temp. Like here, it does kind of like this. It does this kind of thing. Uh, maybe more like something like that. This is the point where it's actually melting. That's what we define as the melting point. But instead of that, there's this long decline in strength. And if you think of, um, say, imagine, if you need a way of conceptualizing this, imagine an old-timey blacksmith who would, you know, take make a sword or make a horseshoe or something like that in a fire. They don't heat the steel. A blacksmith, you can actually go to the Renaissance Fair and see it. They don't heat the uh, the iron up to the point of being molten. That wouldn't they that they couldn't work it if it was molten. Uh, it wouldn't do any good. So what they do is they heat it to the point of being red hot, suddenly it becomes very malleable, they can work with tongs and hammers and things like that. Um, but uh, it's by becoming more malleable, it's lost a lot of its yield stress. So yes, jet fuel cannot melt steel beams, however, um, very simply, its, its strength greatly declines. But yeah, so if anyone ever tells you that, feel free to whack them with a giant wrench. Um, anyway. So another thing we can talk about is um, change in end conditions. Change in end conditions. So this, this lecture has gone way off the rails. Uh, end conditions. Here. So um, if we have um, different if we have different uh, support conditions, we'll have different. Uh, we will have different uh, critical lengths. So can, let me draw a series of uh, columns here. So say I have a fixed pin. I'm going to call this fixed pin. There's a pin here, there's a pin up here, and then it's fixed right at the ground. So this is fixed pinned. Or I could have a fixed fixed. Mm, 
which maybe you have something like this. Again, my funky roller thing here. It's basically a movable fixed support, but it's still going to be fixed. So like this, fixed fixed. Or maybe I could have the flagpole condition be fixed free. Oh man, it's already buckled. Okay. Fixed free. Which I would call the flagpole. Imagine just a flagpole stuck in a, a concrete surface. So uh, let's look how these things will buckle. Again, I'm going to apply an axial load to each of these. P, 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 uh, axial loads each here. And each of these have the same length L. Each of these have the same length L. Now, um, let me say that L prime is going to be the portion engaged in buckling. portion engaged in buckling. So here's the thing, if we look at um, buckling columns, notice they have to be able to bend at the location of the buckling start. See right here? This is a pin, it's free to rotate at this point. But if it's not free to rotate, we can't exactly have buckling at that point. It's, it's fixed, it can't, it can't buckle. So instead, if you have, um, say, something like this, in the pre the L, the, the actual L, the, the original buckling length, is based off of a pin-pin um, condition. But what if you have something like this? If you have fixed, well, the, the curvature is fixed at this location. It has to, be, it has to have zero um, rotation there. So instead, it's going to come out perfectly straight. But then past a certain point, it's going to start bending and it's gonna, oh, it looks too much like an angle. Maybe something like this. And then finally there'll be an inflection point right here, inflection point. This is where it goes from say concave up to concave down and that's where the buckling starts. And so here we do not have the entire section engaged in buckling, only a portion of the column, I shouldn't say section, that's thinks it's cross section, the entire, we do not have the entire column engaged in buckling, we only have a piece of the column, a portion of the column engaged in buckling. So this, for this, now um, this is somewhat arbitrary, but um, as a general rule, and this is based off of laboratory experiments and real world experiment, real world experience and things like that, generally for a fixed pin, the L prime is about uh, 0.7 L. L prime is about 0.7 L. So for the fixed pin, you, the, the unbraced length is actually sort of 0 0.7 times the, origin, the actual physical length. Then for the um, fixed, uh, fixed, you get a curvature like this. It's actually fixed on both ends. So you get something kind of like this with two inflection points, here and here. And the unbraced length is only the portion between the inflection points. Now, um, let's see here. The, unbra the unbraced length here, the effective unbraced length, L prime here, is 0.5 L. And finally, the flagpole, whoever built this was a moron, um, so it's just going to go out like that. Well, I shouldn't say that. There may be, there's probably some edge case somebody could say, hey, I, 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 we needed to do that, and it was, I wasn't being a moron, so fine, I rescind my moron com uh, comment. There's probably, I'm sure somewhere, someone somewhere has a legitimate reason for designing this, but anyway. Here we actually have to increase the L. L prime is actually equal to 2L. But uh, typically how we, uh, how we take this into account is we don't worry about L prime and L, uh, that kind of thing. We actually just modify the uh, Euler buckling equation. So updated Euler buckling equation. We 
the updated Euler-Buckling equation is going to be like this, and I am just going to modify this and say, you know what, P critical is uh, pi squared EI over KL squared. Over KL squared, where k everything is the same as before, except um, KL is the uh, KL is the effective length. We did basically have a modifier applied. KL is the effective length. K times L is the effective length. KL would basically be our L prime from above. So if we have pin pin, I'm going to have a few cases that I'll give you the Ks for. Pin fixed. Um, fixed fixed. Fixed fixed. And fixed free. And fixed free. And this is going to be k equals 1, uh, k equals 0 0.7, k equals 0 0.5, and k equals 2.0. And there are other cases that you might consider as well, but those are just a few of them. Okay. So, moving along. Let us consider um, example 38. And uh, previously on the on the uh, sorry on the first example, let's consider we consider example one, not example 38. In the um, previous uh, portion of the example, we simply found the we simply found whether it was adequate for yielding. But what about buckling? Let's check this thing for buckling. So let me just keep this, and we are still recording. So it will be a longer lecture today. So let me consider, uh, re uh, let me reconsider or continue example one. Example one continued. So again, we are given the same things before. Um, L is five feet equals 60 inches. Oh, actually, let me just tell you, um, I guess I didn't tell you this before, but I also will tell you that it's a pin-pin, which means that k is equal to 1.0. So notice for the yielding case, we don't actually need to know anything about the support or the length. When we start worrying about buckling, we have to. And then I want to check if column will fail by buckling. Will fail by buckling. Column will fail by buckling. Okay, um, I'm going to need, so let me get this here. Solution. Now, I will say I'm going to need the formula for the uh, moment of inertia and um, the moment of inertia for a circular section. Now, uh, let's say the ix is going to be equal to the iy, which the formula is simply pi over 4 r squared or sorry, r to the fourth, so we'll need to use that. And um, we're going to use the uh, mother equation again, actual is less than or equal to allowable. Actual is less than or equal to allowable. And I'm going to say that 120 kips um, here 120 kips is less than or equal to, or is equal, sorry, to P actual. That's the actual load on this thing. And this must be less than or equal to the, the critical load, P critical, which is going to be equal to P, or sorry, to pi squared EI over, um, let's say, KL squared. Over KL squared. Oh, sorry, uh, P critical um, over KL squared. K pi squared EI over KL squared. 
equals pi squared uh, times 29,000 KSI times pi over 4, there's a lot of pi's in here, times 1.125 uh, inches to the fourth power. Inches to the fourth power. All of this over the uh, k, which is just 1.0 here. 1.0 times uh, 60 inches squared, and this is 100 kips, which means um, it's uh, steel, 129,000 KSI. Uh, th that's the yield stress. Okay. And let's see, so then this is um, no good. No good. The actual load on this is 120 kips. The only the allowable load, even without any factor of safety at all, is only 100 kips. So this is actually this is literally going to fail. This is going to buckle. Uh, it's not even close. Fails by buckling before yielding. Fails by buckling before yielding. So this thing is coming down. No good. Somebody's going to have a very bad day. Okay. So let us look next at critical buckling stress. Critical buckling stress Critical buckling stress which I am going to use sigma CR. Critical buckling stress. All right. Well, I know that sigma CR is equal to P critical over A. So that's what I'm going to that's what I'm going to define this as. So we're going to look at, at we're going to look at stress instead of just an axial load. Pre critical over A. So in other words I'm taking the um, I am taking the Euler buckling occasion or occasion. I am taking the Euler buckling equation and reinterpreting it in terms of stress. So what stress on this material will be required before it buckles? So let's look, look through the formula. Pi squared EI over uh, A times KL squared. And um, hey, I know something. Let's look at this. Pi squared, hey, I have a I and an A. Hmm. I over A. I know what that is. That that seems familiar. I've seen that before. Radius of gyration. Let's say R is equal to I over A, so it's a single quantity now. Uh, radius of gyration. Probably saw, you hopefully saw this in statics. Probably did. You did if you had me for an instructor. Pi squared um, E say r squared over kl squared oh, kl that's in the, that's like that and this is how we often see this reported we often see the stress represented this way pi squared e over the factor kl over r squared this is the form we often see for stress of um, of um, columns. And we have a special name for KL over R. KL over R we refer to as the slenderness ratio. So really what the great thing about this equation is that it sort of it neatly breaks up the uh, stress, the critical stress into two factors. 
one, we have the, in, in the numerator, we basically have the material. In the denominator, we basically have the geometry. So um, the numerator, the only real variable here is the modulus elasticity, and that is a material property. And down here, we have a bunch of things representing the geometry. L is the length, K is the support conditions, and R represents the, the property, a property of the cross section. So really, this is, you can think of this as material over geometry. Uh, a stronger material will, uh, will increase the buckling stress. And this is, in other words, this, a higher buckling stress in this case is good because you want a higher buckling stress, a higher, allow, uh, a higher stress required before it will buckle. And here we can see that a longer length will decrease the buckling stress and a higher radius of gyration will also increase it. So, or I can, um, again, summarize this. Sigma critical is equal to pi squared E over KL over R squared. And that's a really neat equation. Here. Pi squared E over, over KL over R squared. Okay. So next, I would like to talk a bit about failure runs and talk and see how columns can fail. Well, we've already seen the two main failure modes, but I'd like to sort of draw out how they interact. Failure modes Failure modes. All right, so moving along here. Um, say I draw a, I'm gonna draw a very peculiar diagram. This is going to be a, on the y-axis, I'm going to have uh, sigma. And on the x-axis, I'm going to have kl over r. Well, we can, can we could, uh, since it's not gonna have numbers on it, I can say this is either the same thing will work out whether you can whether you plot it KL over R or KL. You'll get the same kind of behavior uh, as long as you have a uh, if you're looking at different. Basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say how does a column fail as it um, as it mm, as the length increases. So let's say here we have stress, normal stress, sigma, and then up here. Okay, so let's say I plot the equation um, sigma critical equals pi squared ei over kl squared. What do I get? I get a curve kind of like this. Except I'm purposely going to draw it dashed at first. So this is actually how columns behave. The green line, the dark continuous green line represents how columns actually fail. Here's my sigma yield. And this curve here is defined by um, sigma critical equals pi squared ei um, over kl squared. Or pi squared e over kl over r quantity squared. And actually, I might show this continuing to decrease. It looks like it was leveling off before. It'll just kind of keep on going down. There is not any sort of lower limit there. So really, we can divide this into two zones. We have a short and a long zone. So this represents short columns. Long enough that they're still columns, but they're just short columns. Oh, derp, I'm writing column. Uh, short and long. And this zone is yielding, and this zone is buckling. So what this is really saying is this equation um, shows that the, buckling, uh, that the buckling stress increases um, continuously as the length of the column gets shorter and shorter and shorter. However, you really can only get so far. Like, this equation is kind of blind. In other words, if I put in, oh, let me put a, I forgot a parentheses here. KL over R squared here. This equation is blind. In other words, if I put in a, you know, if I put in a length of say one foot, 
it's going to predict that I can have ridiculous stress in the column. If I, you might get something, you know, say the yield stress was 36 KSI or 50 KSI. If I do this calculation on, a, on say, a three foot tall column, it might happily tell me that that column, oh, that can support 200 KSI, no problem. But we know that can't actually happen. We can't actually get any more than the yield stress. So really, this is sort of a truncation. This is a trun we take the equation would continually happily going higher and higher. But we say, hey, hold the phone. We know we actually can't get any higher than the yield stress. That is the limit here. So really, this is the ultimate equation. It's sort of a piecewise function, showing that below a certain k over r, we ha we're dominated by the yield stress, and above a certain k over r, then the um, critical buckling stress equation um, controls. So finally, I want to work through one more example. And that will do it for this portion of the lecture. So example two. Example two. So say I have a cross section like this. I have a rectangular column. So this is going to be interesting in the fact that it's not going to be symmetric. Or is it, well, it's, that's not the right word. Not Maybe not radially symmetric or... The real critical thing is that the eyes are not the same in both directions. The moment of inertia is not the same in both directions. So this would be my um, x, and this would be my y here. And let's say this is 4 inches by 2 inches. Four inches by two inches here and given given that L equals eight feet which is equal to 96 inches which equals 96 inches um, and that Sigma Y is equal to 40 KSI and that E is 10,500 KSI this is not steel, maybe it's aluminum or something. And say the factor of safety is 3.0. Uh, I want to determine A, the crushing load, and B, the load to cause buckling. So, um, and notice I'm not going to give you the K, the support. We'll actually look at it for different cases. So A, determine buckling load. This is the easy one. Or sorry, determine crushing load. This is the easy one. That's a, this is determined basically CNG 3306, right? Oh, puns, 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 crushing load. Okay. Solution. Well, we always come back to our, uh, our mother equation. Actual is less than or equal to allowable. Actual is less than or equal to allowable. And the actual is less than or equal to p allowable. Well, that, that's that's less than or equal to sign. Wow. Less than or equal to p allowable uh, equals py over the factor of safety, where py would be the yielding axial load over the factor of safety, which equals sigma y. A over the factor of safety, which is then equal to 40 KSI times 8 inches squared over 3.0, which is equal to 106.7 kips. And finally, P actual, we say that P actual must be less than or equal to um, 106.7 kips. So this is really the most we'll ever get out of the column. I don't care how I brace this thing. I don't care how what kind of support conditions I use. I will, if I have a column, um, and I don't even care how long it is, this is the most I will ever get out of this cross section. I don't care how long it is. I don't care how it's braced. I don't care how it's supported. This is the 
crushing load. It is the ultimate limit. You can never get more than this. Next, let us find the load to cause buckling. B, determine buckling load. Determine buckling load or load to cause buckling. So again, we're going to use the um, P actual is less than or equal to P allowable. And P allowable is, oh boy, pi squared, this is going to be a really ugly fraction, pi squared EI over um, KL squared over the factor of safety. Okay, and so let us first figure out the I. I is the min of IX and IY. Alright, and so then IX equals 112 BH cubed, and we do have to watch, you do have to watch out for your units on this stuff. 112 times 2 inches times 4 inches to the third, which is going to be 10.67 inches to the fourth. That's IX. IY is just the opposite. 112 HB cubed is going to be 1 over 12 times 4 inches times 2 inches to the third equals 2.67 inches to the fourth, like here. And then finally, um, I can get that P actual, if I just plug and chug, is less than or equal to pi squared, I'm going to do this in terms of k, and then I'll look at it for different cases of k, um, pi squared times 10,500 um, ksi times 2.67 and just to the fourth, oh, and I, if I didn't mention it, I do need to be firmly aware that this controls. If this thing's going to buckle, it's going to buckle uh, along the weak axis. And this divided by 3.0 times uh, k times 96 inches, that's the length, squared. Now, um, let's see, so let me finally, uh, if I, if you plug and chug through that, you will get that P actual is less than or equal to 10.01 over K squared in kips. So I didn't know anything about the support condition, but let us just say, uh, let us look through some different cases. And so I'm just going to run down through these, pin pin, um, fix fix. A uh, fixed pin, or fixed pin, and then fix free. Fix free. So here, let's look at the k's on these. k is equal to 1.0. Here k is equal to 0 0.5. Here k is equal to 0 0.7. And here k is equal to 0 0.20 or just sorry, 2.0. And what would we find? We would find that for each of these, the P um, actual must be less than or equal to 10.01 uh, kip. Here we'll find that um, P actual must be less than or equal to 40.03 kips. No, that's a 40.03. Um, here we'll find the P actual is less than or equal to 20.43 kips. And finally for the fixed free flagpole, if you're insane enough to build one, you will be uh, very displeased to find that this can barely hold anything at 2.50 kips. So don't build that one. Don't build a flagpole and then try to use a flagpole as a column. Uh, okay.
So um, that does it for this portion of the lecture. Again, well, actually, I should just summarize this. Notice each one of these is going to be far less than the buckling load. So even if we use a, uh, a fixed fixed condition, we're still only getting 40 kips, wh whereas the buckling, or sorry, the crushing load will um, predict that we would get um, 100, over 100 kips out of this. So um, buckling often does, and usually does, actually control when we're talking about, um, when we are talking about um, columns. Okay? All right, I think that'll do it for this portion of the lecture, and thank you. I think I'm going to have a super short thing here, maybe. Yeah, I think I can power through this. It's it's a very short thing. Yeah. And then I'll I have another lecture that I'll just record. So, oh.